Why isn't that? Well, welcome to the 32nd uh, week of the ICANX lectures. I'm Paul Weiss, uh, coming to you from the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, where I'm on the uh, faculty and also uh, editor in chief of ACS Nano on behalf of uh, organizer, Professor Alice Zhang of uh, Beida and myself, uh, welcome. We have an exciting program today on brain science and optogenetics. Uh, we have two speakers, Professor Ed Boyden of MIT uh, will be up first, and then we'll have a panel with uh, Ed, uh, myself, and Professor Ann Andrews of UCLA, who will be our second speaker today. So it's my pleasure to introduce my friend Ed Boyden. He's the Y. Eva Tan Professor in Neurotechnology at MIT, a faculty member in the MIT Media Lab and a member of the McGovern Institute for Brain Research and the Koch Institute for Cancer Research. He's also a Howard Hughes medical investigator. He's the co-inventor of optogenetics and the inventor of expansion microscopy, both of which we'll hear about today. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Inventors, a winner of the Breakthrough, Breakthrough Prize in the Life Sciences, among many other awards uh, that he's won uh, throughout his, his uh, uh, career. It's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Professor Boyden, whose title will be Optical Tools for Analyzing and Repairing Biological Systems. Ed, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for the invitation to speak um, and for the very kind introduction. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, broadcasting here from my basement. <laughs> it is very early here, and uh, I'm really excited to share with you um, actually a bunch of new things, um, including some stuff that uh, at the end of the talk that's uh, hopefully going to be announced next week. Let me share my screen. I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong Perfect. button. Let me let me just do one more time to share. Okay, how does that look? Great. All good? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, as Paul introduced, I direct a group at MIT that works on technologies for seeing and controlling uh, the brain and other complex biological systems. And we focus on tools that use light in order to read or write information from these systems. And we use light in part because there are a lot of other optical tools um, in biology, such as a green fluorescent protein um, that have built up a lot of skill sets around these tools, but also because light is very precise. You can aim light at things and you can measure light with great precision. I'm trying to <clears throat> the big question that gets me out of bed in the morning is whether we can ever understand the brain. And uh, what does understand mean? Well, one idea is what if we can make a computer model of how a brain circuit generates um, something like a decision or a emotion. Um, and ideally it would be human comprehensible and biologically realistic. So this of course is a futuristic goal. We're nowhere near this right now, but it's very clear to make a good computational model to understand something, you must have the right data. And so today I'll tell you three short stories about tools that we have developed or are developing to get this kind of data. First, how can we map the molecules throughout brain cells and the brain cells throughout the brain? There are 30,000-ish genes in the human genome, countless gene products. They make the brain cells do what they do. How can we see them? Second, there are high-speed dynamics of these molecules, electrical activities, chemical activities, and so forth. How can we control these processes? And finally, how can we watch all these processes in action? Well, part of the problem is that the brain has incredibly complicated spatial and temporal scales. Brain cells are enormous. They can be centimeters in spatial extent in the human brain. But the wiring of the brain, so-called axons and dendrites, and the connections between brain cells, synapses, are nanoscale and configured often with nanoscale precision. How can you see across so many link scales from nano to macro? And of course, there's the time axis as well. Brain cells operate with high-speed electrical activities. 
this is also very demanding. So I sometimes only half jokingly say we need to come up with ways to analyze the brain and control it across space and time. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> well, I'll tell you today three short stories about how we have been trying to think about space and time uh, as core variables for helping us design tools. The first half of the talk, I'll tell you about a nanoscale imaging method that we've developed, which allows us explicitly to cross spatial scales from the nanoscale to the macro scale. In the second half of the talk, I'll tell you about tools that we can use on living systems to control and look at high speed biological dynamics. So let's jump right in. Now, the first topic is how do we image with nanoscale precision across extended 3D volumes? Well, many pioneers have invented fantastically precise methods of imaging with nanoscale precision. Electromicroscopy has been used for many decades to make pioneering discoveries about nanoscale features of cells and brains. More recently, super resolution microscopy allows people to image with great precision nanoscale features. But all of these techniques struggle to image large 3D objects, especially if you want to know the location and identity of many molecules. So in our group, starting around eight years ago, we decided what if we do the opposite? Rather than zoom in to the, to the brain, could we blow it up and make it bigger? We call this expansion microscopy. We can take a piece of brain tissue and synthesize a dense swellable mesh of polymer throughout the brain, inside the cells and outside the cells, in between biomolecules and around biomolecules. If we do it just right, and we add water, the swellable polymer will absorb the water. But because the polymer is permeating throughout the brain, throughout the cells, it will actually physically make the brain larger. This started with two then grad students, Fei Chen and Paul Tilburg, and now about half our group works on this technology. This idea owes a debt to several old ideas. In 1980, a physics professor, Toyoshi Tanaka at MIT actually, uh, we're studying the physics of swellable polymers. So this cartoon, you can see an animation of the kind of thing he studied. The white lines are sodium polyacrylate, and we just added water shown in blue. The water is drawn in through osmotic force, and the polymer threads swell apart from each other. Being sodium polyacrylate, the polymer threads are highly charged, and they repel each other. The net effect is a very rapid, within minutes, volumetric phase transition. It increases in size by a thousand fold in volume or more. So Tanaka's group studied this and figured out some of the beautiful physical and mathematical properties of these phase transitions. Now, of course, you can't just dump the polymer on top of the brain. You need to get it inside the cells between the biomolecules. How do you do that? Well, Christine Dreyer and Peter Hausen in 1981, just one year after Tanaka's paper, showed that you could chemically install a dense mesh of polymer or hydrogel that permeates a piece of biological material. They took, they took embryos and tadpoles and synthesized a hydrogel of polyacrylamide in these specimens. So this is a charged neutral hydrogel. We're using a charged hydrogel. But nevertheless, they showed that you could use this strategy to facilitate antibody staining, which helps you visualize certain biomolecules, and imaging. So it's fun to think, you know, if you put two and two together back in 1981, maybe this technology could have been invented then. So around 2012, uh, we started in earnest trying to think about if we could install this dense mesh of swellable polymer, could we take a cell like the one on the left and turn it into something like the cell on the right in this cartoon? The cell on the left is a normal cell. The cell on the right the biomolecules have been pulled apart. Two biomolecules that are touching are now some distance apart from each other, and two biomolecules that are some larger distance apart will be scaled up by a linear factor. In other words, biomolecules are hovering in space like a three-dimensional constellation of stars, but with their relative organization preserved. Well, to make it happen, we had to invent several chemistries, which I'll tell you about now. 
with the help of some animations. In this animation, proteins are shown as brownish blobs. We had to invent anchors or handles that'll bind to each class of biomolecule that we care about and allow us to pull the biomolecules apart from each other. In this animation, the handles for proteins are shown as purple blobs. Ideally, every protein will get one purple blob. Next, we have to weave a dense spider web-like mesh of the polymer. We do that through a strategy not unlike what Christine and, uh, and Peter did in 1981. We bring in monomers shown as little white spheres. They form through a process called polymerization into long polymer chains. This will weave that dense spider web like mesh of swallowable polymer, sodium polyacrylate throughout the cells and tissues. When the polymer chains encounter the handle, they form a covalent bond. So if you think about it, the polymer threads can expand and create force. The handles shown in purple can apply the force to the biomolecules shown in brown. We're almost there, right? Well, we had to invent one last step. We had to soften the specimen so that we can pull the molecules apart. We used detergents or heat or enzymes to do that. Then when we add the water, the polymer threads will swell apart from each other. But this time, because of the softening and because of those handles, the biomolecules will be pulled apart from each other, far enough apart that we can resolve them on a microscope without having to resort to expensive or exotic hardware. Well, does it work? In early 2015, we announced the discovery that we could expand a brain. In, pa in panel B is a small piece of the mouse brain. In panel C is the same piece of mouse brain tissue. About a day and a half later, we formed the polymer, anchored key molecules to the polymer, softened the specimen with enzymatic treatment, and added water, and it grew by about a hundredfold in volume, about four and a half times in each direction. In the upper left is a sketch of the polymer that permeates throughout the cells and in between the cells. The packing of the polymer is very dense. The spacing between polymer threads is only a few nanometers around the size of a biomolecule. That means we might be able to resolve molecules down to single molecule precision. In the lower left is a sketch of the polymer once it's been expanded. Not shown are the anchors and the biomolecules that are being pulled apart. So by design, the density of the polymer, the anchors, the softening of the tissue, we wanted this process to be as even as possible. Here's a little movie of a piece of brain tissue, which we polymerized earlier, and we're gonna add the water and expand it in this little movie. The whole movie is more like an hour, but we sped it up to fit in one minute. And we add the water right there. And I hope you can see that this piece of brain tissue is beginning to expand before your very eyes. Okay. So we designed the process to be as even as possible. The polymers are dense. The anchors are evenly distributed. We soften the specimen so that it does not resist expansion. But this is biology. We have to test our hypothesis. And so we spent a lot of time in the early years quantifying the distortion. To be upfront, the distortion is not zero, but it's very small. When we expand a specimen, we have a few percent error over the length scales of a microscope's field of view. Here you can see the kind of analysis we do. In purple are pre-expansion images taken using a classical super resolution method like STORM or SIM. In green are post-expansion images, and we overlay them. Where they overlay, you see white. We then do a non-rigid registration. Basically, we calculate how much warping there is. And that's how we found that the warping is very small, just a few percent over a microscope's field of view. In this case, the um, samples you see are hex cells with antibodies against tubulin, labeling microtubules. The antibodies are equipped with fluorophores, so you can see the microtubules. 
So in most biological questions, people care about the relative organization of biomolecules. A few percent of error is okay. But nevertheless, we're still working to make the technology even more precise. We can also gauge the resolution by looking at known structures. Microtubules, for example, we know what they should look like thanks to decades of electron microscopy and other structural imaging methods. We can take our images and deconvolve or divide them by the known ground truth and estimate the resolution. A typical microscope might have a resolution of 300 nanometers. If we expand by four or five fold, we might expect to get 300 divided by four and a half or 70 nanometer resolution. And as you can see here, that's what we got. Um, now, I told you earlier, the spacing between polymer threads is only a few nanometers. Could we do better if we expand more? And I'll later show you that is the case. But even with four and a half fold expansion, there are lots of things that we can do that are difficult, if not impossible, through earlier technologies. On the left are pre-expansion images, and on the right are post-expansion images from the same brain specimen, a piece of the mouse brain expressing yellow fluorescent protein in some neurons. We also stain with fluorescent antibodies against bassoon, shown in blue, and magenta, excuse me, and Homer 1A, shown in magenta. The color code is shown on the left-hand side of the slide. As we go from the top of the slide to the bottom, we're zooming in. Each white box is zoomed in in the picture below. As you can see, the left-hand images are blurry, but the right-hand images, which are post-expansion, are much clearer. The blue and magenta stains are for pre- and postsynaptic proteins. And as you can see in the lower right, we can cleanly resolve the pre- and postsynaptic parts of synapses. If we measure the distance between these protein densities, as shown in the upper right, we get the same answer that Catherine Dulac and Zhao Wei Zhuang measured many years ago with storm microscopy except we can now take these images on a regular confocal microscope. There are lots of things that we can stain with fluorescent antibodies and then image. So in a collaboration with Eric Betzig that was spearheaded by Ray Gao, Ro Asano, and Gokul Padula, we stain with antibodies against proteins found in mitochondria and lysosomes as shown in the upper right, or myelin proteins as shown in the lower left. We can then image the locations of these molecules with nanoscale precision. Now, when you expand a piece of brain as a byproduct of the 100-fold dilution with water, it becomes transparent. And in this collaboration with Eric Betzig, we use one of their light sheet microscopes to image these expanded specimens. Even though you can do imaging on regular microscopes, you can also play cool tricks, like use light sheet microscopes to image as well we found we could image orders of magnitude faster than the classical nanoscale imaging microscopy methods. You can label neurons with fluorescent proteins. In combinations, these are called Brainbow, developed by Jeff Lichtman and Josh Sains and colleagues at Harvard. Here's a piece of the mouse hippocampus with different neurons expressing different combinations of fluorescent proteins, shown at the bottom. Could you map the wiring of the brain? Well, in the top middle, you can see that it's difficult. If you look at the top middle image, it's blurry. The color code is beautiful, but it's hard to resolve the fine wiring of the brain. But if you look at the top right, it's the same field of view as the top middle, but you can clearly see the wiring of the brain. Many groups are now using this combination of expansion plus color coding to map brain circuits. Everything I showed you so far is with protein labeling. What about other kinds of biomolecule? When Oz Wasi was a grad student in our group, we worked on looking at messenger RNA. Here you can see a bunch of pre and post expansion images where we expanded cells and labeled post expansion <clears throat> the RNAs with fluorescent in-situ hybridization, or FISH. As you can see, the post-expansion images are much more clear and high resolution than the pre-expansion images. In the upper right, you can see the yield is very good. We can anchor and expand RNAs away from each other. We can also anchor the proteins and the RNAs at the same time, expand both 
and label both. Here you can see a piece of mouse brain tissue where we've anchored the proteins and the RNA. You can see, for example, the yellow fluorescent protein showing the shapes of neurons. In magenta is post-expansion staining of RNA. And we can localize individual RNAs with nanoscale precision in the intact brain. <clears throat> so far, everything I've showed you is expanded by about fourfold or so. Can you expand more? Well, one idea we had was to take a specimen, polymerize and expand it, like I told you earlier. Form a second polymer in the space opened by the first expansion and expand it again. J.B. Chang, when he was a postdoc in the group, showed that this could work. Recently, we've made a version of this that can be done with all off-the-shelf chemicals spearheaded by Dublina Sarkar, Jinyun Kang, and Oswasi. The top cartoon shows how it works. If we take a specimen and just stain it with antibodies normally, the problem is the fluorescent antibodies that label biomolecules have trouble getting into dense protein areas like synapses. But if we form a polymer, anchor the proteins to it and expand it, form a second polymer in the space opened up by the first expansion, and stretch out the first polymer more, we can decrowd or separate proteins from each other. Now, antibodies can access proteins inside the protein complexes. Compare the first row or the second row of the cartoon at the top. The first row shows only some antibodies, the green and red labeling proteins. But the second row shows blue and yellow antibodies able to get inside the protein complex. This is important because synapses are very dense. At the bottom of the slide, you can see us labeling different synaptic proteins with different fluorescent antibodies. You can see beautiful detail of these synapses, including nanostructures within the synapse. Now the decrowding actually does make it better to label post-expansion than pre. Here are a bunch of examples in panels B, C, and D, where we, care, we compare pre-expansion staining in yellow to post-expansion staining in magenta. As you can see, there's not much yellow. For calcium channel subunits shown in B, a presynaptic protein RIM12 shown in C, or a postsynaptic protein PSC95 shown in D, you see much more detail in magenta than you see in yellow. The expansion has decrowded or separated the proteins from each other, and we then get better, la better labeling. Not all proteins are crowded though. As you can see in panels F, G, and H, Homer 1, Bassoon, and Shank 3 show good labeling both pre and post expansion. You see good labeling in the yellow channel as well as the magenta channel. Using this strategy, we can look at the detailed nanostructures of synapses because we can see things that were difficult to see before. Collaborating with Tom Blanke's group at the University of Maryland, we imaged calcium channel subunits after expansion which if you recall, are hard to see before. We can see how they are coordinated with other molecules in detailed nanostructures within synapses. This may facilitate the efficiency of synaptic transmission. Collaborating with Liwei size group, we looked at Alzheimer's model mice. We looked at amyloid plaques. You can stain with antibodies against A beta, which is one of the major components of these amyloid plaques. Again, yellow is pre-expansion staining and magenta is post. You get much more detail post than pre. In fact, if you look at the bottom of the slide, post-expansion staining even showed these detailed dots of amyloid, which we could not see with pre-expansion staining. This worked for multiple antibody types. Furthermore, in wild-type mice, we did not see these dots, showing that it's not an artifact of nonspecific staining. <clears throat> This is a very busy slide, but suffice it to say that we can also look at proteins within these newly discovered amyloid dots. One thing we found were ion channels. Maybe the amyloid is doing interesting things that might alter the excitability of the brain. So far, everything I showed you is about the brain, but you can apply expansion to many other tissue types. From top to bottom, these are human specimens of prostate, lung, breast, pancreas, and from left to right, we're doing normal and cancer-containing specimens. This is work led by 
Yongshan Zhao and Octavia Bicure when they worked with my group and Andy Beck's group. This slide is very crowded, and I don't really mean for it to be read, but over 180 papers and preprints have already come out doing some kind of expansion process. People are applying it to the kidney, to the fruit fly brain, to plants, to bacteria, to all sorts of questions about motor proteins and the blood-brain barrier and epilepsy and cell division. The list goes on and on and on. We have a big culture of teaching. If you go to our website, expansionmicroscopy.org, then you'll find tutorials on how to do it. In 2018, we showed step-by-step -step protocols of how to perform the most popular expansion techniques. And because of COVID, we worked out tutorial classroom style protocols that people can do in classrooms uh, and on their own. We show, for example, detailed photographic step-by-step -step protocols of how to handle the gels and the specimens. So our hope is that we can help everybody do nanoscale imaging. That's the first half of the talk. To summarize, we've discovered we can evenly expand biological systems. These are simple techniques that use all off-the-shelf chemicals. By magnifying, you can see proteins, RNAs, and other biomolecules as well. And the technique can be applied to a wide variety of scientific questions and a wide variety of species and tissue types and cell types. In short, anybody can do nanoimaging now. In the second half of the talk, though, I want to address a key limitation of expansion microscopy. It can only be done on preserved cells or tissues. After all, you cannot expand a living thing, right? How can we see and control biological processes in a living cell or a living brain? <clears throat> First, I'll tell you about control. How can we control high-speed dynamics in biological systems? The first thing we wanted to control was high-speed electrical activity in the brain. Carl Dysroth and I met when we were both students at Stanford around the year 2000, and right away we started brainstorming. How can we deliver energy to the brain and activate or shut down brain electrical activity? We started, we started just going through all the laws of physics. Could we use magnetic fields, mechanical force, light? We decided light could be really cool, if you could use the light, because light, of course, is very fast and you can aim it. Also, you can bring light into the brain using fairly simple techniques like optical fiber implantation. Then the question became, do we engineer a light sensor for neurons or can we find one? I became very fascinated by a class of molecules called microbial opsins. These are membrane proteins shown in the lower left that are found in the membranes of single-celled microbes, such as microbes that grow in salty water, like in the upper left. These membrane proteins absorb light from the sun. It's captured by a vitamin A relative called all transretinal. The protein will change shape and pump an ion from one side of the membrane to the other. The first to be found was a light-driven proton pump, which would capture solar energy and store it in a chemical ion gradient. That was in 1971. About a decade later, people found light-driven chloride pumps from the same species of microbes, also used to store energy. And finally, around the turn of the millennium, people found light-driven ion channels from algae. Being channels, they don't store energy, but they're used to sense sunlight and help single-celled algae navigate in water. Flash forward to the current day. We really lucked out. Serendipitously, we could find members of all three of these classes that could be genetically expressed in neurons. The all transretinal, the vitamin A relative that they need is amazingly found in mammalian neurons. You can deliver light of the right color and you could activate these molecules. So on the left-hand side, Brian Chow and Shua Han, when they worked with me, found that we could express light-driven proton pumps in neurons, shine light that's green or yellow, pump protons out of the neuron, and shut them down. In the middle, Xue and later Amy Chuang worked with me to find light-driven chloride pumps that we could put into neurons, 
shine yellow or green light on them and shut them down. So by deleting neural activity, we can find out what those neurons are needed for. On the right-hand side, uh, originally Carl Dysroth and I put a channel rhodopsin, a light-driven ion channel into neurons and shine blue light on them and found we could activate the neurons. And later, Nathan Klepetki, Jan Kucho, and others that I'll talk about later um, helped us optimize the technology. What does optimize mean? Well, when Amy Chong was a grad student in our group, we found that we could put a red light driven chloride pump in neurons. Why red light? Well, red light can go deeper in the brain than other colors of visible light. It's less absorbed by the brain. So we could take a light driven chloride pump that Amy characterized, put it into the brain with a virus, shine red light from outside the skull, and we could turn off neural activity even of awake behaving mice. Leah Acker, later working with me and with Bob Desimone, showed that this molecule, which we call JAWS, could be used in non-human primates to inactivate large volumes of the cortex and alter behavior. When Nathan was a grad student in the group, he found a molecule that we call crimson, a light-driven ion channel that can be driven by red light. Red light can then activate the neurons and similarly can be used to activate large volumes of the brain. So that is about large volumes. What other limits are we trying to confront? Well, with Valentina Emiliani's group, we've been trying to get the spatial precision very good. And work spearheaded by Valeria Zampini, Dimitri Tanese, and Or Shemesh, we try to work on an optimal optical and molecular strategy for single cell activation. Valentina's group has invented two photon holographic projectors, such as shown at the top. They can create 3D sculptures of light, like shown at the bottom. Now, we have to invent a molecule that will be a good match for such a powerful optical technique. One idea is to express light-activated proteins just at the cell body. If you express light-activated proteins everywhere, as shown on the left, well, you can aim light at a single cell, like the dotted circle. But all of the cells that have stars will be activated because they have processes that pass through the dotted circle. In the middle though, you can see what would happen if we could localize the opsins, the light activated proteins, just to the cell body. Then the dotted circle hits one neuron and the other neurons will not be activated. This is an idea that McLean Bolton, Jawa Pan, and Frank Werblin showed would work with the original light gated ion channel that Carl Dysroth and I put into neurons many years ago. We decided to make an optimized molecule. It turns out that a molecule we had found earlier, CRCHR, has very powerful photocurrents, 10 times bigger than the molecule that Carl and I put into neurons. We found a small peptide that when fused to CRCHR would localize it to the cell body and not on the axons and dendrites. Then when Valentina's group holographically activated single cells, what they found as shown in the upper right is that you would not get stray activation. In the lower right, you can see that because the molecule is so powerful, we had good temporal precision. So to summarize, we found that light-driven molecules for the natural world, just by serendipity, we could find the, some of them that were safe, fast, and effective enough to work in delicate, high-speed neurons. And these molecules are now reaching their physical limits of performance. Red light activated molecules that can control large volumes of the brain and very powerful, very high speed molecules that are approaching the temporal and spatial limits of the technology. That's a good transition to the final topic that I wanna tell you about today. I'm just gonna take a sip of tea here. which is how do we read out brain activity and other signals? Well, in this case, we are not so lucky. The natural world has not made molecules for us that allow us to see high speed activity of cells just out of the box, right? People have to make these. How do you make them? 
while many groups have been taking fluorescent proteins, such as those from jellyfish or corals, and connecting them to sensor domains that will then sense a biomolecule. After all, there are about 30,000 genes in the human genome with countless gene products. To see them in a living cell would be very informative. So people design and evolve these proteins. <coughs> when Erica Jung and Kirill Pjakovic were in my group, we decided to see if we could build a robot to speed up the evolution. How does evolution work in the lab? Well, people like Francis Arnold won the Nobel Prize for developing directed evolution. In directed evolution, you take a gene and make many mutants of the gene. Some of the mutants are better and some are worse for any given goal. But we wanted to see if we could do this in mammalian cells so we could facilitate neural control and readout. We also wanted to screen along many dimensions. After all, optogenetic molecules were fast, safe, and powerful. A glowing or fluorescent indicator of a cellular function should also be fast, safe, and powerful. And we need all three. If you evolve a molecule to make it faster, you might make it less strong. If you evolve a molecule to make it more strong, you might make it less safe. You have to select for all of the properties at once. So we developed a robotic strategy for dreaded evolution along multiple dimensions in mammalian cells. In this cartoon, the top row shows how we make mutants of a gene and transfect them into mammalian cells, one gene per cell. In the bottom row, you see how we do the selection. We have a robotic microscope that can scan the cells and evaluate each of them along many dimensions looking for fast, bright, and strong, and safe responses. Then, in the lower right, we bring a robotic arm in and suck out the cells, and therefore the mutants, that are better for our goal. This is what the machine looks like, and it is now commercially available, and we're now thinking about scaling up our efforts to make lots of new indicators. But to show that it worked, we wanted to see if we could improve fluorescent voltage imaging. This is the creation of molecules that light up or fluoresce when a neuron is active electrically. We started with a fluorescent voltage indicator called Quasar 2 from Adam Cohen's group at Harvard. In two rounds of directed evolution, we made 10 million mutants. We put them into cells and used our automated cell picking robot to pick out the cells and therefore the genes that were better. The right hand side shows why we need to be able to do multi dimensional screening. Each circle on the right-hand side is a different cell with a different mutant. Some are brighter, but not well localized to the membrane, which is where the voltage is measured. Some are well localized to the membrane, but not bright, so you can't get good signals. But along the diagonal in the upper right are mutants that are both. This is a crowded slide, but suffice it to say that in the upper left, we found a molecule that was well localized to the membrane, in the top of the slide, you can see that we got a molecule that was much brighter than the original gene. And in the lower part of the slide, you can see that it had good dynamic range, it was fast, and it was photostable. So we were able to achieve all the goals of our screen, even along multiple dimensions. Clarina Shuhan's group at BU, um, Kiro Pjakovic, Seth Ben Swisson, and Wan Sang showed that a soma localized version of this, recall that earlier I told you that locating a molecule of the cell body could, could clean up activation. Here we showed that locating a indicator of the cell body could also clean up reporting. We can use a fairly simple microscope like shown in the upper left to image using fluorescence, the activity of these cells. In the middle of the slide, you can see lots of red traces that look like they are electrical traces. But they're not, they're being recorded on a microscope. The way fluorescence works is we shine one color of light on the cells and they glow with a different color of light. And so that's the simple microscope architecture shown in the upper left. <clears throat> you can look at many cells at once, as shown in this picture. There are eight different cells in the hippocampus of an awake, head fixed but behaving mouse that were active during a period of time here. You can see the traces on the right-hand side of the slide. By the way, you can use the SOMA localization trick where we express indicators of the cell body 
for many kinds of indicator. Recently, um, our group showed in a paper published just a few weeks ago, spearheaded by Ur Shemesh Chengyan Lingu and Kirop Yakovic, that we could take calcium indicators, which glow green when neurons are active and let calcium in, and express them at the cell body. Compare A to B. A is the regular calcium indicator. B is when we target it just to the cell body. And similarly, D is the cell body targeted version of C. This cleans up the background fluorescence and greatly improves the quality of images. We see less crosstalk between cells. So we are not just evolving new indicators, but figuring out how to use existing indicators better. And that's a great transition to the final story I want to tell you about today. There are literally hundreds of fluorescent indicators of different biological functions. This is a screenshot from Xinjiang's database, Biosensor DB, at UC San Diego. There are hundreds of genetically encoded fluorescent sensors that will light up when the pH or ATP or cyclic AMP or potassium or other molecular changes occur in a living cell. Wouldn't it be great to image many signals at once? Then we can see the relationship between these signals. After all, if there are 30,000 genes in the genome and countless gene products, ideally you would see many signals at once so you can determine how they interact. You can think of a cell as a network of many kinds of signals all interacting at high speeds. The usual way to do this is you get sensors of different colors. You can use a green sensor of pH, for example, and a red sensor of calcium and put them into the same cell. Then you can see the relationship between pH and calcium. But it's hard to make sensors of new colors. Also, there's only a couple colors that can be resolved by a typical microscope. So Shannon Johnson and Cheng Ying Langu in my group, we worked on a strategy to try to get different fluorescent indicators to express at different points in a cell. As a cartoon in the upper left, suppose you have a fluorescent indicator of one signal located at certain points within a cell labeled one and fluorescent reporters of a different signal two located at points labeled two. Then you might be able to image these two sets of signals at different points in the cell. While the cell is alive, let's suppose both of these signals are being reported by a green reporter you'll see lots of green dots that blink on and off. Over time, you get movies of these green dots blinking on and off. Now, how do you know which signal is which if they're all the same color? Well, when you're done with the experiment, you can preserve the cell. Then you can bring stains that will bind to the different indicators and one after the other, stain, image, and wash out the stain. Stain the second one, image it, wash out the stain. And over and over again, you can figure out which indicator is at which point. OK, how can you make this work? Well, we found that we could take fluorescent reporters and fuse them to self-assembling peptides. That causes the fluorescent reporter to spontaneously assemble into a cluster within the cell. Also, we fuse an epitope to the fluorescent reporter. That way, we can stain with an antibody afterwards and figure out which reporter is at which point. So going back to the original cartoon, we can take several different fluorescent reporters and fuse them to different peptides. They will then spontaneously assemble into different clusters. Even if all the fluorescent reporters are the same color, we can still tell them apart because they're at different points in space. When we're done with the experiment, we preserve the cell and then stain with antibodies against each epitope, take a picture, wash out the antibody, stain with a second antibody against epitope two, take a picture and wash it out. And that can be done over and over again. Well, does it work? Here we take GCAMP6, a fluorescent calcium indicator shown in panel B, and if we fuse it to a pair of self-assembling peptides, the pair helps make the clusters big enough to see, you can see in panel C, lots of little green dots in the cell. So it works. We spent a lot of time characterizing the safety and efficacy of the clustering strategy. And to make a very long story short, we did not see changes in the dynamic range, the signal to noise, the kinetics of the sensors. It did not depend 
on whether the sensor clusters were big or large, bright or dim, and we did not change the natural properties of the cell signals. We also checked for cell health using a lot of different measures, cell death, inflammation, DNA damage, and the list goes on, and did not see any changes in cell health either. So finally, we can use the modularity of the strategy. Surprisingly, it's very modular. You can do it very easily. And we can make many indicators cluster at different points in space. Here in panel A, we're taking three different indicators, fusing them to three different sets of peptides and three different epitopes so we can later immunostain and localize them. In panels B and C, in each case on the left-hand side, you can see the green dots that appear when the cell is alive. So of course, while the cell is alive, they will be blinking at you. And on the right-hand side, you can see shown in multicolor images, what happens if we do the antibody staining against the epitopes afterwards. So some green dots later show up as red or magenta and are calcium indicators. Some green dots later show up as blue and indicate cyclic AMP, an important cellular signal. And some green dots later show up as yellow and indicate protein kinase A, another important cellular signal. And what's new here is we can, using a microscope that is doing live imaging of just one color, green, we can see all three signals at the same time. This helps us see the relationship between the signals. For example, some cells, these are cultured neurons, by the way, when we challenge them with a drug called forskolin, which drives cyclic AMP, we can see calcium transients. Some cells shown in H had slow calcium transients, and some shown in I had fast calcium transients. What is the implications for protein kinase A? Well, amazingly, we found that there was a relationship between these different signals. Neurons with fast calcium changes had strong protein kinase A changes. Neurons with slow calcium transients had weaker protein kinase A changes, as shown in panel L. So we can see the relationship between different signals, in this case, signals that are very important for processes like learning and memory. I should point out, if you image these different signals in different cells and try to compare them later, you will not be able to see these relationships. You have to watch them at the same time in the same cell. We can do these experiments in live brain slices as well, and we see very similar effects. As shown in panel E, neurons that have fast calcium responses had strong protein kinase A responses under force gland challenge, and neurons with slow and delayed calcium responses had weaker protein kinase A responses under force gland challenge. You can do this trick with more than three sensors. Here at the top, same format as what I showed you earlier, we can have four sensors. In the live cell, you see green dots blinking at you, and then afterwards you can preserve the cell and see the identity of each dot through serial antibody staining against the epitopes. And again, you can then see four signals at once and how they relate to each other. And we can even do it with five signals at once. So to summarize, We've been developing robots that allow us to evolve new indicators, but we're also inventing ways to use old indicators in new ways, expressing them at the cell body to clean up background fluorescence or targeting different indicators to different parts of cells so that you can see many fluorescent signals at once. Inside our group, we would love to assemble the different techniques into a pipeline. What if we could watch all the signals that we want then control them, and finally, map the molecules. Could we integrate these into a model of the brain? And in our group, we're trying to see if we can apply these tools to small brains, like those of fish and worms. When the Moore Freifeld was a postdoc in our group, she adapted the expansion microscopy method to larval zebrafish, and we found that we could see synapses in the brains of these small fish. JU in our group did a similar adaptation of expansion microscopy to the worm C. elegans. What if we could image all the neurons in an entire small brain, derive their relationships between signals within the neurons and between the neurons, and then use expansion to map out the architecture of the nervous system? 
and we are adapting live imaging methods to these small animals as well. The voltage indicator that I mentioned earlier, we showed could work in larval zebrafish. We could observe neural activity with great precision. And a similar improvement in neural imaging could be done in the worm C. elegans. So we're very excited now that we could try to image all the activity in a small brain, control it, and then make a map. I've acknowledged along the way all the people who have led the projects in our group, but I want to end on a slide that also acknowledges many other people who helped, shown at the top of the slide, and then a great many groups all over the world who we work with on these projects. We have a big tradition of sharing tools, so please visit our website, synthneuro.org, shown in the upper right, to learn how to use these tools and to access reagents and tutorials. And don't hesitate to email me. My email is in the upper left if you would like to ask questions about how to use the tools. We have a big culture of teaching, sharing, and collaboration. Since after all, the brain is so complicated, we all need to work together in order to make progress. And with that, uh, uh, happy to help if any of you need the tools to help on projects, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you so much, Ed. Let me pull my screen up here. What a, what a terrific talk. Uh, Thank you, appreciate it. And then we have uh, quite a few uh, questions from the audience here. We'll take a little bit of time with those and then <clears throat> go on to a panel uh, with uh, Professor uh, Andrews. So uh, the first question we have is, uh, uh, Professor Boyden, it's exciting uh, to meet you online uh, for expansion microscopy. Do you find damage or changes in tissue function? Is there still function? Uh, can one go in the opposite direction and compress even higher densities like a black hole in the universe? Great question. So the expansion process only works on preserved non-living things. There is no function. <clears throat> we are expanding the molecules away from each other. So the molecules also are separated. It's really to map the molecules in cells and tissues, but we're not mapping any dynamics or function. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm gonna take a sip of water if you don't mind. <clears throat> of course. On the other hand, we are preserving the relative organization of the molecules, and that's very informative. Um, can we go in the opposite direction? You can. We actually published a paper in Science in 2018 on what we call implosion fabrication. Take the swallowable polymer and add water to make it big. Then you can laser print interesting materials inside, like gold nanoparticles or DNA or metal. Then shrink it. And just as the expansion preserves nanoscale features, the implosion makes nanoscale features. It's a cheap way of making nanofabricated structures. So we're now collaborating with many people to see if the implosion fabrication, as we call it, can be used to make interesting things like metamaterials or optical devices. Fantastic. Uh, the second question is related, I think. Uh, dear Professor uh, Boyden, the expansion technology is mainly for physical structure, as you just uh, mentioned. Is there a way to expand chemical, biological, or electrical information and or interactions? Yeah. So some people are starting to play around with this. Um, a group at Stanford University um, tried to expand bacteria. Bacteria have a tough cell wall, so they had to use an extra enzyme to soften it. But they had the, the following creative idea. This is Bo Wang's group at Stanford. What if you don't soften the, the cell wall? What they found was that different bacteria expand at different extents if you don't soften it. So this suggests that you could try to investigate protein-protein interactions by pulling on them. And they uh, have written now a couple of papers about this way of assessing mechanical properties of cells. Um, so we have been focusing more on even expansion for imaging, but I think there's a new field maybe if, if it takes off that could emerge on using the expansion process to make measurements of interactions inside samples. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, the next uh, question is a quite general one. Uh, for optogenetics, can you comment on its future directions? Absolutely. 
Yeah, so thousands of people are already using optogenetics to study the brain, activating brain cells to figure out what they can do in terms of behavior or pathology, and turning them off to figure out they're needed for. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, I think the molecules are starting to reach their physical limits. By redshifting them, we can get to large volumes. By making them powerful, we can make the activity very fast and very strong. I think the future directions are largely twofold. One is we need to have other data, like anatomical data, like through the expansion method, or activity data, like through calcium or voltage imaging. That will tell us the kinds of things that might be fun to investigate through optogenetics. If you see a pattern, you could try to drive it with optogenetics. If you see a pathway, you could try to activate it with optogenetics. So I think a lot of the science will be best informed by integrating optogenetics with other technologies in the years to come. Wonderful. Uh, the next question comes from Jimmy Shu at uh, ECNU. Uh, what are the next steps for SOM Arcan? <clears throat> so SOM Arcan is what we call the somatically localized voltage indicator Arcan. And to be upfront, it's not as bright as we want. There is no perfect voltage indicator right now. Our molecule has some advantages and some disadvantages. It's very fast. It has very high signal to noise, but it's kind of dim. Other groups have invented molecules that are much brighter to be upfront, but they tend to be slower and they tend to have poorer dynamic range and signal to noise. So um, the next steps are we'd like to continue to make it brighter. There is no perfect voltage indicator yet. All right. And then we have one more question. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful talk, Professor Boyden. Can you, this is a uh, comedian here, has shed some light mm -hmm. on monitoring dynamic neurochemical networks with multiple neurotransmitters using optogenetics? Yeah, so monitoring dynamic neurochemical networks is, is, um, is a, whole, a whole area. Um, and uh, I think we'll hear a bit about these kinds of things in, in Anne's talk as well. Um, yeah, I think this is a great future direction. You know, how do we uh, monitor many extracellular signals? So neurotransmitters, of course, are going from one cell to the next. Are there ways to use many sensors at once to monitor many of these? I think this is a great, interesting, interesting direction. Um, but currently, our, our our current tools are are not able to 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 do that. At least in our group, uh, it'd be great to great to discuss this and uh, with with, uh, with uh, maybe in, in the discussion or something. Very good. Well, this is the point at which uh, we would normally be able to come on the uh, stage together, and I would hand you a, a plaque thanking you uh, for giving this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, for now, we'll have to uh, settle for the electronic version of that. Uh, it's always such a great pleasure to visit you in your laboratory uh, when we orbit through uh, Boston and Cambridge, and hopefully as uh, things settle down in the world, and we'll get a chance to meet uh, there, uh, here, and elsewhere. Uh, so on behalf of uh, Professor Alice Yang and myself, you know, thank you for this talk and for sharing your work uh, with, with the world today. Thank you, it was a lot of fun. And uh, now what we'll do is uh, move on to a panel uh, with uh, Professor Andrews. Uh, so uh, Professor Ann Andrews, I'll give a, a, a greater introduction when we, when we uh, uh, introduce your talk in a few minutes, but we thought we would spend some time first uh, discussing uh, the field. Uh, we have many students and postdocs in the audience uh, and younger, younger uh, folks who are interested in your work and uh, the wisdom that you might uh, be able to uh, share with them. And so I, uh, let's have uh, Professor Andrews unmute. Uh, and we'll, we'll begin. So the first thing, uh, I think many uh, people would like to know how you choose people, we'll start with Professor Andrews, how you choose people for your laboratory. And I can give a little bit of background, it expands a very great range from you know, uh, neuroscience all the way to electrical engineering and, and nanotechnology and people go from uh, doing uh, chemical measurements all the way to, you know, working with uh, live behaving animals and uh, testing their behavior. 
Thanks, Paul. That's a, an interesting question. To start, sometimes we don't choose the people who join our laboratory, they choose us. <laughs> and part of that has to do with this large collection of really diverse people that work with us. Um, so in general, we're looking for people who have strong background in the area that they're coming from. Uh, for instance, physical chemistry or materials chemistry or engineering or neuroscience. Um, but beyond that, we're looking for people that are curious and want to learn other areas of science. So we don't really silo the different parts of the group. Everybody participates in every meeting. Uh, the physical scientists and engineers have to learn the biology. The biologists have to learn uh, the physical sciences. And so um, people that are really interested in kind of crossing those boundaries that look at science from a holistic perspective are, are people that usually um, are interested in our group and we're interested in them. And Ed, uh, you know, much of what you do is develop new tools. And I think in uh, both uh, Anne's group and mine, we also have, you know, uh, strong components that do that. There aren't so many people who are, are trained nor necessarily uh, talented in that regard. So how do you find the people who, who work with you to do the, both the tool development side and then the science that you do with, the, with those tools once you have them in, in hand, so to speak? Well, I really liked Anne's uh, response. You know, the interdisciplinary collision between ideas and fields is so powerful. And uh, similar to what, what Anne said, um, I really value you know, interdisciplinary learning and collaboration and, and mentorship. Um, a lot of people join our group uh, you know, uh, uh, from one field and then start learning a different field. Um, the first year in my group, I only half jokingly call the constructive failure year because people flounder around trying things. And we just expect that most of what somebody will do will fail, but they're going to see things that maybe nobody's seen before. And mm -hmm. that might motivate them to learn how to tackle the problem from a different angle. And uh, most of the, the tools that I talked about today, for example, arose from a student or postdoc who was floundering in one direction for a year. And we saw why an existing tool wasn't working the way we wanted. And then we pivoted into a different direction. Um, and sometimes it took more than a year. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so I, I really believe also in, in uh, experiential constructive failure, you know, really struggling with a problem. And we wanna really make the lab safe for failure. And I wanna use that word a lot because I think failure really is the root of a lot of success. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wanna kind of destigmatize that word a bit. You know, um, that's one reason why I try to emphasize the idea that we're gonna fail a lot of the time, but we're gonna see things nobody's seen before. And that might be a source of wisdom. We have, a who tells his, sorry, we have a colleague who tells his students and postdocs that they can't talk to him till, till they break $5,000 worth of equipment. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that same rule in our laboratories. Uh, Alice, did you want to say something about how you choose, how you choose people for your group? Okay. Uh, okay, me? Yes, please. Uh, okay, uh, that's a really nice question. So actually, I chose the students. The majority, you know, was from a student related field. So here today, I really like to, you know, hear the answers from both of these two professors that hire students in many, many different directions. But then in China now, majority, yeah, we make this, we have the students in almost the same, you know, department or the same majors from different universities. So that time gives some difficulties for us to do, you know, this kind of very close link or, you know, multi kind of functional, you know, devices or the tools. Yeah, sometimes we need to find outside the uh, collaborators in different department. Yeah, so if we can open up, you know, for hire different students from different depart of different majors, it will be very helpful. Actually, here I'm. Uh, yeah, I have a one question for Ed. Is Ed, you have a uh, three degrees? Yeah, when you are under, how you handle that? So three degrees in different department, how you handle that? Yeah, well, I was very lucky uh, and privileged. I um, I grew up in Texas and. Uh, 
Texas public education has a magnet school where people can go do the first two years of college and the mm -hmm. last two years of high school at the same time. And I came from a, a suburb which didn't have much science, um, uh, no universities, no colleges. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was very excited to go to this magnet school. Uh, we have to live away from home, so it's a little bit scary. But I ended up being an undergraduate for six years. And I studied you know, chemistry for the first two years and I transferred to uh, MIT. Um, and uh, to get a, a wider variety of scientific experiences. And then I switched my major to electrical engineering and physics. Um, um, so it was a bit, of, a bit of luck finding a magnet school in my, near my hometown that would allow this kind of thing. And then, um, and then uh, really getting interested in different topics later. Okay, that's good to know. You have six years, you know, for the end or for this three degrees. So they give you a lot of opportunities in the future. Yeah, but now I think you don't have to do that anymore. So now at MIT, for example, we have a bioengineering major and you can learn multiple disciplines through one degree. And uh, you know, when I was starting out, there wasn't such a thing. Um, if I were starting out now, maybe I would just get one degree in bioengineering because then you learn the physics and you learn the chemistry and the biology. I think there's a lesson there not to rush things. There's a tendency of students to say, well, I could finish, I could take the minimal set of classes and then be done and move on. But what, what students learn during that, that time where there may be a little bit of flexibility, they get in the research laboratory, they see what being a scientist is really about, makes a big difference. In our uh, graduate admissions now, unless students have done research and succeeded, we're unlikely to accept them to our PhD programs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, uh, that, you know, compacting everything as, a tendency of some, you know, students who are used to AP exams or whatever the equivalent is, you know, elsewhere in the world, in some sense, that's a hindrance. And mm. I think Ann, you might want to comment on that because the, the route you took gave you, you know, all this background that very few other people uh, in the world have. Uh, were you speaking to me, Paul? Yes, I was. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I my degrees were all in chemistry, but but I had some experiences in the laboratory as early as an undergraduate that were in you know a biological setting, actually a medical setting, and you know that really piqued my interest in biological systems. So so I kind of made up my own programs as I went along to get that interdisciplinarity um, in my in my training. I was lucky as an undergraduate that we had um, a track in the chemistry major where you could, you know, kind of make your own chemistry um, program. And, and so that allowed me to take a lot of, of different classes that, you know, classes that were different than maybe uh, students would typically take. And then when I did my doctoral degree, I actually did my thesis research at the NIH. So, and I, and then I also took courses at uh, Georgetown Medical School. So I was at three different institutions. So, you know, sometimes you just have to make your own as, you know, Ed said, and, and put it together based on your interests. And, and I think Paul, you have a good point in terms of taking your time. Um, the other thing I wanted to just, just say is that, you know, one of my philosophies, and I think it, you know, it's the philosophy that, uh, that others share is that, you know, the natural world is the natural world. It, it defies in some ways the boundaries that we like to set up for pedagogical purposes. Um, so for instance, we have physics and we have chemistry and we have engineering, and we have biology, but, but really natural systems encompass all of these, these, um, these disciplines. And so, you know, if you're interested in studying the natural world, then, you know, at some level, all of us have to be able to cross some of these boundaries um, to, to try to, to, to get the natural world to yield its secrets. Well, maybe you can comment, you, after your chemistry degree, you end up doing your PhD in a clinical psychiatry group. And so, right. I mean, how does one, how does one do that? <laughs> we'll start. We'll start there. Well, it was an opportunity that was presented to me, luckily, by my my mentor, who was 
um, you know, he was kind of a courageous forward looking guy. And he, he had had an, he was a psychiatrist, but he had an undergraduate degree in chemistry. And so he had always been interested in this, you know, this kind of aspect of the world and was willing to kind of go outside these boundaries. But, but it also meant that I spent most of my PhD training as an, as an only graduate student. In, in a sea of psychiatrists. So, so it was really great. It immersed me in problems in, of the brain and particularly in psychiatric illness really early in, in my development. But it also meant that I had to, um, you know, I had to, to be strong enough to kind of pursue my training by myself. I didn't have a cohort of, of students to do that with. And that, that was okay. Um, I think, uh, Ed, you and I both spent time at Bell Laboratories, which was the sort of physical sciences analog to what Anne described at NIH, where you know a group was at most one postdoc and one technician, but it could be actually zero or one of those. And so maybe uh, you can comment on what you learned there and how you translate that over into an academic group, which is quite, quite large. Sure. Yeah, so my last year of college, um, I worked uh, partly remotely, but for a few weeks on site at, at Bell Labs. Um, and it was my first neuroscience experience before, you know, I trained in these uh, physical science fields. And um, it's, uh, you know, uh, people would have lunch together and talk about ideas. You know, it, uh, it was very uh, helpful for somebody who wanted to switch fields. And um, I was very intimidated by neuroscience. I don't think I'd taken a biology class since high school. And to be honest, I spent a lot of my first year once I started an actual PhD, just floundering, um, trying things out that didn't work. And, and um, if I hadn't gone to a summer school at Woods Hole at the Marine Biology Lab, the year after my, my first year in the Stanford PhD program, which you know, kind of got me you know, to, to learn how to think like a biologist in, uh, in, a, in a focused way. Um, and my, my uh, co-mentor at the time, Jennifer Raymond, had taken this class and suggested that I do it. Uh, and she had pivoted from mathematics. Anyway, I feel like there's a lot of, of um, learning to think like a biologist that's so important and, and sort of like you know Anne's immersion in psychiatry um I wonder if my experience is getting immersed in different biological areas was really important to to, to go from a physical sciences arena into into biology uh, but I like the collaborative nature of the Bell Labs environment to get back to your original question you know people really would talk and brainstorm up crazy ideas and, and I like that I also found it a great place to change fields and as you said, when you go to lunch, you'd sit around with the found for me it was surface science, the founders of the field were around the table. And that really made uh, uh, you know for an interesting and exciting time and, and a way to learn a lot. I I had a similar experience to you in some sense in biology, where I took a pass fail as a freshman. The next class I took was Anne's. I I just barely I got the lowest possible passing score on the entrance exam. And then uh, <laughs> And then I audited the class after that. <laughs> so it was not to embarrass myself further. <laughs> and, and you can also comment on, on that transition from you know, being in a laboratory that's you know, uh, staff and, and uh, postdocs and technicians over to academics where you have uh, both younger, uh, you know, younger trainees and uh, a larger set of them. How was that? You know, how did you find that uh, transition? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> it, I, I, it, I'm having trouble sometimes hearing the difference between Ann and Ed, believe it or not. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, you know, it was a really exciting transition for me, quite frankly, because at that point and prior to that point, it was really becoming clear to me that the numbers of things I wanted to try or the types of directions I wanted to go in were expanding like Ed's microscopy pretty quickly. And <laughs> it was not really gonna be possible for me to explore these ideas you know, by myself or with one other person. So, you know, again, I was really lucky. My first faculty appointment was in a chemistry um, program at Penn State, and there were lots of really willing students. They had a, a wonderful neuroscience program. And so, you know, right away to have, you know, half a dozen people who were 
you know, super curious and super motivated, um, you know, was just really exciting. So um, I would say that the longer term vision, however, has been in kind of transitioning from really thinking about working with students and postdocs in terms of the science we can do together and transitioning um, to thinking more about what it is that I can do to, to teach them to become, become independent scientists. So that, that's become you know, an increasing part of, of what, what I try to do in my own work as I'm working less and less and less in the, and don't work really in the lab much at all. Uh, and, you know, and as Ed said, um, teaching, whether it's in the classroom, in the laboratory, at the desk is, is really an important part of, and really an exciting part of, I think, what we do. Actually, there's something that connects all three of you. You're all on the faculty at institutions where you train. And so maybe Alice, let's start with you. Uh, is it is how is that is there an odd, oddness to having colleagues who were your professors and when you got your lab started at Beda did that uh, you know how how did that go okay yeah that's a very good question actually it's the first time someone asked this question to me yeah actually in China I was graduate uh, you know in a different department was a mechanic department not a microelectronics department so I'm a kind of strange move to a new lab you know move to a new field but that time uh, in Beida you know Peking University try to start a new field it's a microelectronic mechanic system so they need someone with no, you know, mechanic system. <laughs> now everyone knows for the microelectronics. So I was a newcomer to the new uh, institution and to this group. So I started with uh, underground. <laughs> Because I have to learn everything. I have to learn all these kind of new skills. So that time I training myself. I like Anne's words before. So you, you don't have students, you don't have a lot of, you know, support. That time you do a lot of things by yourself. And then you learn a lot and then you open mind. So the most important things, yeah, as uh, a faculty members, uh, I joined a new group, a totally new one from underground. So I open mind for everything. I have to learn all this stuff. So that's how I train myself. I, I have a best colleagues because they're all teaching me, helping me. <laughs> and Ed, how about your experience going back to MIT? Yeah, it's interesting. <clears throat> I think it helps in two regards. Um, and then there's one subtlety. One regard is um, because I've been a student there, I think that helped me uh, be a mentor for the undergrads because um, uh, I could some I could empathize with the kinds of of classes they were taking and the kinds of of um, paths that they were trying to pursue. I had lots of questions of people who also wanted to train in engineering but work on the life sciences. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, yeah, my my lab was originally just down the hall from my my undergrad mentor so um uh, my research was different enough i had worked on quantum computing back then and then i switched into biology uh, so there everybody was very collegial you know i think if there was too much overlap this is the subtlety maybe it's hard to have a, a unique identity um uh but i think uh since i had gone and spent some time at stanford and then come back and i changed quite a bit by then in terms of what i wanted to work on uh, that was very helpful but yeah, being able to empathize with the students, you know, the teaching, the training, you know, there's the personal side as well as the technical side to being a, a teacher. And Anne? Well, I, I mean, I agree with Ed. It was very um, helpful for me going back to Penn State for my first faculty position. I knew all the course numbers. I knew the course sequences. I didn't, didn't have to become acquainted with that. So it was really easy for me to to talk to undergrads, guide them. But, but there was a, another side to that and I'll illustrate by way of a story. Um, at Penn State, we taught freshman chemistry to about 2000 students in the fall, in the fall uh, semester. And they would be divided up into these blocks of 400 students. And the, the class was taught in this building called the Forum. And the first time I had to teach that class, 
the whole summer before I had these terrible nightmares, right? I had imposter syndrome um, so, you know, so badly because, because I now had to stand up in this, this huge, you know, classroom and teach in the very same room where I had taken that course. <laughs> so, um, you know, th there was that to get used to, but, but, um, but it was, it was fun once I got rolling. I can definitely sympathize with that feeling. I taught in that same room, but I'd never <laughs> taken that class nor <laughs> high school chemistry. So I had to learn a week or two ahead of the students the first time I taught and, and found that class completely amazing. If someone had taught me that earlier when I was a student at MIT, I might've been able to skip a lot of the later physical chemistry and other classes. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what uh, you know, each of you have, have uh, taken on these uh, big problems in, in neuroscience and developing the technologies uh, needed for them. If, you, if there's a high school student or a college student out there, uh, what would you advise them uh, to, to uh, focus on in either their, their formal studies or what they might do uh, outside, of, outside of school? Of course, if they're listening here, that's a great sign and you know we definitely want to encourage uh, those uh, you know those folks. Uh, and maybe we'll start with you, and then uh, I'll go over to Ed. I think my advice would be to to do try to do two things at the same time. And I don't often advise doing two things at the same time, but I think in this case it's useful. And the first is, of course, to to really learn your fundamentals. Um, they become important. They are important. You'll find them repeating themselves, Paul, as you just said, um, over and over again. But at the same time, not to let the pursuit of, of grades and classes and fundamentals um, prevent you from really developing your love of science in the natural world. You know, this is a time to explore, to read widely, to read books about scientists, to read books written by scientists, to read fiction <laughs> about science, um, to, to read in scientific areas widely, to meet people who work in science widely, and to really cultivate, um, you, you know, science as a, as a smorgasbord um, as the, you know, as the really buffet that it is, instead of allowing yourself to just be so focused on, on the fundamentals. And uh, Ed? I could not agree more. And uh, yeah, I really think learning the fundamentals solidly is so important because those are the things that are still going to be true 20 years from now, 40 years from now, and, and knowing them very well, you know, paves the way for a good career and yeah the but you know knowing how to think about problems you know getting uh into the trenches and trying to struggle with a problem you know i think that's uh that was for me very important in terms of struggling with really difficult problems and and learning how the process of science occurs too um often by the time that you know we learn something from a textbook uh, we, we get the final product but we don't see all the ups and downs and mm -hmm. ambiguous detours that history took and and uh, yeah, learning how to struggle with science, I think, is also really important because the, the tough problems of the world are tough problems. And whether it's, you know, climate to ecology, to energy, to the brain, to diseases of all kinds, you know, the list of problems goes on and on. And, and learning how to, to struggle with these uh, problems, how to take different points of view, if that can be practiced. And some classes offer that. But if there are opportunities to participate in research remotely or or in person, um, that, that can be very valuable too. And I think you both make a very good point that actually doing science is very different than what we see in classrooms. And then also what we see in the talks that we give. If we uh, apportioned the time that we uh, get out of our successes versus how much time we spend with that kind of persistence that you both talked about to to get to where we want to be, you know, both your projects took many years to develop. There would be about one minute of data in our talks in an hour and 59 minutes of struggles and failures and things that didn't work. And it probably wouldn't make a very interesting presentation except for the sociological part of 
this is what science is. You have to be persistent to take <laughs> on a problem and you have to think in, you know, about different routes to get to the, you know, to get to the goals that you're after in your, in your career and in the, you know, steps along the way in the laboratory. One of the great pleasures of this series is Alice and I get to talk about who we'd like to hear, and we're both very great admirers of the two of you, and we've been looking forward to this, this talk. And Alice, I think you also, you know, have thoughts about, you know, what, uh, what you'd like trainees to, to learn when they start in science, and that's part of the reason that you created this ICANX series. So maybe for the, yes. the more general audience, uh, you can... You can okay. Yeah. So, Paul. Yeah, I know Ed was going to leave in few minutes. So I just have a one short question. It's a, how you guys keep the curiosity, you know, for the science for such a long time. You know. Yeah, Ed, you change several times for the topics, and uh, you keep curiosity always. Could you please go ahead and say something for this? Sure. Well, <clears throat> I guess I was always interested in where science met the human condition, or you know, the, these eternal mysteries about, you know, about life, you know, um, actually when I went to that magnet school, the high school in Texas, I was on a college campus. I was very lucky. I got to work in an actual chemistry lab. Um, and it was a group that was working on the origins of life. You know, could you make DNA from inorganic material? So I, I was really drawn to these questions at the border of almost philosophical questions and practical questions. And then when I transferred to MIT, um, after a couple of years, I ended up working on quantum computing, another topic that's sort of between the, the mysterious and the practical. And uh, those are both really hard problems. So you have to pick a problem well, right? You know, creating life from scratch, that was too hard. <laughs> like quantum computing also trying to be really, really hard to make a good quantum computer. Um, and so uh, it was just sort of luck that the third time's a charm, I guess. Um, I, I started this neuroscience expertise that, as Paul alluded to, uh, started with a collaboration uh, where I was mentored by some people at Bell Labs. And um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was just uh, worked out that time, I guess. So yeah, <laughs> okay, find, 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 find the thing that obsesses you, I guess, and keep <laughs> keep trying even if it fails. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good word, so keep trying. If it fails, you go ahead and do another. Yeah, so Ed, yeah, so how about your experience for the curiosity, you know, as always? <laughs> Yes, um, I have to say that my deep curiosity is in what drives human behavior. And that curiosity was sparked for me in my first uh, laboratory experience, out, you know, outside of the classroom. I was working as a chemist in the Allegheny County Coroner's office. And we would have to wait for the samples to come from the autopsy room in the morning. And so little by little, I would migrate over to, to autopsy and you would really see this kind of full scale of, of horror of, you know, what, what people can, can do to each other um, and how, you know, the terrible ways people can die. And that, that's kind of morbid, but, but we're, what really developed for me there was the, the curiosity of, you know, why people do what they do. Um, and how much emotions drive us um, to, to behave in, in many of the ways that we behave. And, and that, that kind of fundamental question has stayed with me all, all through my career. I don't know that I'm any closer to understanding it, but, um, but it is something that, that you know, I just, I, it, I just can't let go of it. I think about it all the time. <laughs> so I think Ed has a good point. Find what you really have a passion for. Ball as a scientist. <laughs> Good. So well, I think time is up. Ed is going to have yes. another meeting. And uh, as a question or, 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 or coming into the board, someone was or, or asking the question, how is the founding of City of, of Brain Science? I think, well, I'll answer this question in her talk. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here with you all. Thank really appreciate you so it. so much. And good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Have a good day. Right. Yeah, you too.